In various published writings, Professor Richard Pring has focused on the role of government in education, and his, his writing will be used as the springboard for what follows. In Privatization in Education, he warned about the inappropriateness of the market metaphor for education, a dangerously misleading analogy for understanding educational processes and for directing educational policies. He returned to this theme in uh, the name of the book, is The Life and Death of Secondary Education for All. The way Pring uses the term privatization, in common with most other commentators, is to mean the assigning by government of services to private rather than government control or ownership. That is, it is a top-down approach. So for the privatization of education, it is governments that bring about reforms such as parental choice, contracting out, and universal vouchers, which will have the effect of denationalizing education. However, there is another possible usage of the term which I have coined in developing countries and emerging economies across the world. There is a bottom-up or grassroots privatization taking place where the people themselves, not the state, often against the wishes of the state, are engaged in reassigning education to private rather than state control and ownership. It is privatization de facto rather than de jure. In this paper, I explore if Pring's objections are also applicable to this grassroots privatization. There will only be time to look at two of his major objections regarding education as a public good and accountability. The kinds of arguments applied here are likely to be applicable to other objections raised. What I hope to do is to show that grassroots privatization is not subject to Pring's objections, that in the context discussed, privatization de facto might not be such a bad thing after all, certainly better than any alternative. The revolution of low-cost private education is taking place across much of the world. Far from being a phenomenon that only serves the middle classes and above, my research has shown private schools burgeoning in poor communities across sub-Saharan Africa, Asia, and Latin America. The main initial body of the research, funded by the John Templeton Foundation, explored slums, shanty towns, and poor peri-urban communities in India, Kenya, Ghana, and Nigeria, as well as rural communities in India and China. My teams typically found that the vast majority of school children, 64% to 75%, in urban and peri-urban <coughs> communities were attending low-cost private schools, while a significant minority of children, around 25% to 30% in rural communities, were similarly attending the schools. On quality, we tested a total of 24,000 uh, children in mathematics, English, and one other subject, and found that children in the low-cost private schools significantly outperformed those in government schools even after controlling for family background variables and possible selectivity biases. The private schools appeared to be doing this for a lower per pupil cost, at least as far as teacher salaries were concerned. In poor parts of the world, including some of the most disadvantaged areas, the majority of children are using private rather than government schools. Parents prefer private, perhaps, most, perhaps because academic achievement is higher in them <clears throat> than government schools, and teachers more committed. Finally, many of these low-cost private schools are affordable to some of the poorest families, while the average overall cost of sending a child to private school is not much higher than sending a child to government school. The basic idea from Pring is that there are societal, social benefits to be had from people being educated. If a parent educates his child, this child, so the theory goes, will contribute to society by being healthier, fairer, more democratic, and so on. But these public benefits, it is claimed, are not reflected in the market price of education. So there will be market failure. <clears throat> it seems odd discussing this in the abstract, because we have powerful evidence, some adduced above, <coughs> which shows that poor parents are willing to spend on education and so produce the desired social benefits. That is, the perceived private benefits of schooling are enough to make them pay for education, which parents thus pay Society at large can obtain the social benefits that arise from individual parents' decisions. The poor parent also knows that there are private benefits from being educated, especially for a poor person, as it is one of the best roots out of poverty. 
and the child will not only be able to get a middle class job with education but will also likely assist her parent as she gets older so instead of the pessimistic conclusions reached by pring a much more favorable outcome emerges the key, the key points seem to be the cost of schooling and the value of the private benefits it is a mistake to blatantly assume that the cost of schooling will be so high and the private benefits so low that parents will decide not to educate their children the only way to address the issue is not in the abstract but by looking at the evidence and seeing whether poor parents are actually willing to spend on education and so produce the desired social benefits the evidence adduced in my research seems to show that poor parents are prepared to pay for schooling furthermore since the quality of education in parent funded private schools exceeds that provided by the government sector the corollary social benefits of education are commensurately greater as well i believe that we should look to the actual choices facing poor parents rather than posit some transcendental ideal of government schooling that works that works well and is suitably egalitarian the actual choices that face poor parents are between grossly inadequate government schooling and higher quality but still improvable low cost private schooling if these arguments hold then the externality of social justice related to pring's lack of discrimination would seem however counterintuitively to be brought about better in the privatized system than the public one one addition that might need to be added to the system as currently found is further catering to the poorest of the poor this would require all disadvantaged children to be able to access private schools this could happen through targeted vouchers cash transfers innovative ways of allowing allowing school payment and of course growing prosperity as nations develop another addition might be certain regulations of for instance the curriculum to ensure that particular externalities of education such as education for democracy or social cohesion were met these additions would not change the overall argument that the privatized system was providing much of what was required a second major area of disagreement concerns accountability <clears throat> education is spring rights of such significance for people lives and the public good needs to be accountable market theorists would not disagree about the need for accountability however pring seems to accept only one kind of accountability political accountability for instance when he writes about free schools he says what are free schools free from they are free from local accountability that is accountability to local government having discussed the externalities of education uh, with which as noted market theorists would not disagree pring then writes about that a public service because of these externalities must be openly accountable to the public which it serves by whatever democratic processes this might be achieved accountability again is only political accountability but there is another kind of accountability this is accountability to parents and through them to the students in her school if parents withdraw their children and thus their fees from a school the proprietor will go out of business so she uh, so she works to stop this happening i am puzzled by this alternative accountability to parents and children doesn't merit more favorable attention from philosophers like pring the world bank <coughs> calls it the short route to accountability to be contrasted with the long route where accountability comes only through poor people's voting for politicians who then may but usually do not enforce accountability through the political process accountability is a relationship between purchaser and provider with five constituent parts delegation finance performance information and enforceability all these parts are important it says if any are missing service failure results now the wonderful thing about a competitive market the world bank argues is that it automatically creates accountability between sellers and buyers we can substitute parents and schools into the world bank's formula to show the advantages of this short route to accountability in a private schooling market it would mean this you choose a primary school for your child delegation and pay the monthly fees finance the schooling is delivered to your child performance you check on how your child is doing in school perhaps by noting how her exercise books are marked or how well she speaks english with with his friends uh, which generates relevant relevant information about its quality 
and you then choose either to send your child to the school next month or to change schools in forcibility, affecting the income of the school owner. On the face of it all, on the face of it, all the accountability stages appear to work well. In a government school system, however, the accountability system wouldn't function, function at all well. That education is in some senses a public good and has societal benefits is not disputed by market theorists. In fact, such considerations led one notable market theorist, Milton Friedman, to suggest government funding of education through vouchers. But education also has private benefits. The evidence from developing countries seems to suggest that there would not be market failure in educational provision that would lead to the need for government intervention, except for targeted provision for the very poorest of the poor, as above, and perhaps some regulation of the curriculum to provide social benefits. Second, Prince accountability is only political accountability. However, there is also market accountability, and the discussion showed the advantages of this over political accountability, at least in the kind of situations where grassroots privatization was occurring. These considerations suggested that these major disagreements of Pring to privatization might not apply when focused on grassroots privatization in certain developing country contexts. Um, I I gather you didn't get a chance to hear Harry Brighouse's paper, which was in the previous session. What was interesting to me, given the disagreements you and Harry have had in the past about private and public schooling, was the similarities between your paper. Um, okay. As I see it, both of you assume that the capitalist system and what you keep referring to as the poor are basically here to stay. The main difference is that Harry wants to mitigate the um, effects of socioeconomic structural inequality on children's educational opportunities through regulation by the state, whereas you seem to think that um, the so-called interests of the poor can be equally served by, by the private market. Uh, now, my problem with this is that I think the interests of the poor are not to be poor. Those are the interests of the poor. And that's not going to happen unless the system itself is changed. So while I'm all in favor, like you, of grassroots educational initiatives that come from the bottom up, and there's a long history of those in, in um, radical education, as you know, uh, my question is, do the educational experiments set up by some such grassroots initiative, do they reflect the unequal competitive values of the capitalist system and all its structural inequalities, or do they try and reflect and enact and teach different values of solidarity, fraternity, equality? Do they challenge the, the structural inequality of the market, which you seem to just take with you behind the veil of ignorance? One would accept that there are various ways of organizing society, and I think it would be very clear, now this is a longer argument, but I think it would be very clear that the capitalist system, the market system, um, would be a preferred way of organizing society. It creates opportunities, it creates wealth, it creates prosperity, and it, uh, it helps get rid of the poor. You know, it helps raise the poor out of poverty. I am very dubious, I suppose, about the role of government in regulating um, anything, but regulating the market of education. And, and my, my work, as you know, is not so much in America and Britain anymore. It is in countries like India, the way, where you are now, and, 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 and other countries. And there, I think, you know, you see many more difficulties. You see it much more starkly laid out how the, prob the, the problems there are in allowing government to regulate a, a, a system um, and assuming that the, the high ideals can just be translated into into practice that will pour. I think you are dismissing uh, this democratic ideal too quickly. Because in the villages, we have a Panchayati Raj, and anyone who knows how the Panchayati Raj functions and how the participation of the pancha in the Panchayati Raj of women and Dalit and other deprived people has increased in last 25 years, and what role education has played in that, that is not accounted in this big picture of uh, democratic decision-making. 
yeah and there is a village education uh, committee actually so so we are when we talk of democracy and all the time how how we should treat pakistan that's not the only democratic decision democratic decision about how to use the community land what to do in the school how people are interacting there uh, and is those decisions education and a certain kind of sensitivity in education does play part even if the education is not higher education even if it is only uh, 10th pass uh, in this argument we always forget the teacher exploitation in the private schools few days back there was a report in the in, in newspaper how teachers are trans money is transferred to their account and then they have to take the cash out and deposit it back in the school uh, we forget that uh, one little thing is that Professor Brighouse made an art argument about this market being accountable in telephones, etc. My telephone is not working very well, I can throw it out. But my child is, is not uh, doing well in the school, I cannot actually take, I cannot, cannot actually take him out every six months. So school choice cannot be changed so frequently and therefore market does not feel that punch. Uh, in this country which was highly illiterate, Casteism was never questioned in that education. So if the private education hands us the similar kind of education which does not teach us how to, how to question the power structures and casteism and uh, status of women, then even if we all become literate in that, I think there is something missing. The, the fact that you have the right of exit keeps the proprietor, the entrepreneur, the owner on their toes. They know you can leave, so they do not want you to leave and they will therefore try to ensure that the things you desire from the school in quality, attentive teachers and so on, are maintained. So it's not that you have to leave um, all the time, it's that the proprietor knows you can leave. Now, so that, that's the first point about these transaction costs. But in the end, parents do move between schools and, 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 and that is possible. When I then, you know, I, I then also want to think what the market could achieve, and it's maybe a sense that um, the, the existing model of schooling is very much a model that was, was sort of stultified by the state, and, and the transaction costs are very much higher. But a market-led approach to education could well lead to a much more interesting, perhaps technologically based model of learning where the transaction costs of changing between suppliers are not so high. That's a sort of more speculative answer to you.